Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Thursday, May 27th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Potentially good news for long-term COVID-19 immunity. Pizza farms, not just a figment of my imagination, apparently a very real and wonderful thing. And the story of a naked mole rat named Joe who just won't die, and what he could mean for human longevity. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Well, there may be some good news for anyone who got COVID-19 and managed to get through it relatively unscathed. Two new studies indicate that you may be immune to reinfection for at least a year and possibly for your entire life, especially if you also got vaccinated. And for the rest of us who did not get COVID but did get vaccinated, we'll probably still need booster shots whenever they come out. But even still, these studies, if they hold up, are very welcome news about the longevity of immunity. One of the studies, published Monday in the journal Nature, focuses on antibodies coming from the bone marrow. And the other study showed that memory B cells persist and mature for at least a year after infection. Now, while the bone marrow study has been peer-reviewed, it was posted early and unedited by the journal. The second study is a preprint that is not yet peer-reviewed, so bear that in mind moving forward, but let's dig in a little more to the science here. Quoting the New York Times, Upon first encountering a virus, B cells rapidly proliferate and produce antibodies in large amounts. Once the acute infection is resolved, a small number of the cells take up residence in the bone marrow, steadily pumping out modest levels of antibodies. To look at memory B cells specific to the new coronavirus, researchers led by Ali Elabedi of Washington University in St. Louis analyzed blood from 77 people at three-month intervals, starting about a month after their infection with the coronavirus. Only six of the 77 had been hospitalized for COVID-19 the rest had mild symptoms. Antibody levels in these individuals dropped rapidly four months after infection and continued to decline slowly for months afterwards, results that are in line with those from other studies, end quote. Now, that decline had previously caused some alarm, but some experts say that memory B cells remain effectively dormant in the bone marrow, ready to leap into action if needed, and this study backs that up. Of the 19 people the researchers got bone marrow samples from seven months after infection, 15 still had detectable memory B cells. The fact that not every single person among them had them, they say, shows that not everyone who had COVID-19 had a strong immune response, and that is even more reason that you should still get vaccinated, even if you tested positive at some point. What's particularly unique about this study is the use of bone marrow samples, which are difficult to obtain and therefore not frequently used in studies. The New York Times points to a 2007 study that showed, in theory, how antibodies for various viral antigens could survive for decades, but this study provides rare evidence of that theory. Now, in the other study, researchers analyzed the blood samples of 63 people who had been infected with COVID-19 and recovered from mostly mild symptoms a year prior. About a third of them had received at least one dose of the vaccine. Quoting the Times, So-called neutralizing antibodies needed to prevent reinfection with the virus remained unchanged between 6 and 12 months, while related but less important antibodies slowly disappeared, the team found. As memory B cells continued to evolve, the antibodies they produced developed the ability to neutralize an even broader group of variants. This ongoing maturation may result from a small piece of the virus that is sequestered by the immune system, for target practice, so to speak. A year after infection, neutralizing activity in the participants who had not been vaccinated was lower against all forms of the virus, with the greatest loss seen against the variant first identified in South Africa. Vaccination significantly amplified antibody levels, confirming results from other studies. The shots also ramped up the body's neutralizing ability by about 50-fold, end quote. So this is potentially great news for people who had COVID-19, but why doesn't it apply if you just got the vaccine and never had COVID? The simple explanation is that fending off a live virus is different than your body's response to a single viral protein from a vaccine. For those that recovered before getting a vaccine, their body's immune response probably already matured and therefore grew even stronger when re-exposed via the vaccine. But none of these studies looked at people who hadn't been infected, so who knows, maybe there's some more good news on the way. But the bottom line is, get vaccinated, 
If you never had COVID, you'll be protected for at least a little bit. If you did have COVID, you can't be positive if you were one of the few whose immune response wasn't great. So get vaccinated just in case, and you may end up with super forever immunity. I was today years old when I learned about pizza farms. Now, when you hear the phrase pizza farm, what do you think? Do you imagine it must be some kind of figurative term, you know, some kind of phrase for big business pizza, maybe something like click farms? Would you believe me if I told you it's a literal phrase? It's literally about farms where pizzas grow. Now, sadly, they don't, like, grow on trees like we all know money does. You can't just pluck a slice from a branch and be on your way. But in the 90s in California, a farmer named Darren Schmall had the idea to make a pizza-themed farm to teach kids about farming. Because how else did you get kids to do anything in the 90s from reading to saying no to drugs? Pizza. Well, Schmall's concept really took off. His pizza farm was getting tens of thousands of visitors a year, and he trademarked the concept as a form of agritourism that ended up especially taking hold in the Midwest of the U.S. Which means if you are from the Midwest, you're probably wondering why I think this totally routine occurrence is so mind-blowing. But listen, this is hot and fresh news to the rest of us. So what is a pizza farm if not a place where they grow pizza pies from seed? It's a farm that grows tomatoes, herbs, and other veggies as pizza toppings, as well as wheat for the crust, and keeps dairy cows for cheese and sometimes pigs for slaughter to make pepperoni, or at least to teach a lesson about where it comes from. All with the purpose of educating kids or other visitors about the farming process, and using the farm's output to make delicious pizza for everyone to enjoy after a long day of learning about the circle of life. That part you may have been able to guess, but here's the minor detail that had me thinking I'd been punked and was reading some kind of fake Wikipedia page. A hallmark of Schmall's Pizza Farms is that they grow the crops on a circular piece of land and divide the plots into pizza slice shaped wedges so that the crops and animal pens themselves create a pizza. A literal pizza farm in more ways than one. And lest you think that pizza farms are a relic of the 90s, they are still very much around. The New York Times says they even got a bit of a boost last summer during the pandemic as an outdoor form of family fun, in the same way that drive-in theaters had a brief renaissance. You may not be able to find a small approved pizza wedge designed farm franchise near you, but a local farm that serves up pizza on the weekends using all local, if not direct from their own farm ingredients, more and more of those are popping up all over the place. And I for one cannot wait to hit up one of these in person. Most rodents only live a few years, maybe six at the most for some of the common ones. That's why comparative biologist Rochelle Buffenstein was stunned in the late 90s when the naked mole rats that she'd been studying just wouldn't die. She was working with some that were more than 15 years old. And one naked mole rat who she first met while doing doctoral work in the 80s, a pink and wrinkly dude named Joe, he is now 39 years old and officially the oldest living naked mole rat on record. He's barely aged at all in nearly four decades and there's every expectation that he'll make it to the big 4-0. Thanks to the work of Buffenstein and an increasing number of scientists studying naked mole rats in various capacities, we now know that the creatures have an astonishing lifespan of around 30 years. Joe is an anomaly of the anomalies. Of course, anyone who's read Harry Potter knows what's going on here. Joe is clearly a shape-shifting wizard who faked his own death after joining a cult and murdering his best friends, so he's been hiding out as a naked mole rat for the past few decades. I'm on to you, Joe. But magical explanations aside, naked mole rats, it turns out, are fascinating. In addition to living exceptionally long lives for rodents, naked mole rats, unlike other mammals, aren't susceptible to many diseases like arthritis, cancer, and Alzheimer's. They can also withstand long periods without oxygen and are impervious to pain from acid. 
There is so much about naked mole rats that is absolutely wild, and researchers are still trying to figure out the reason for a lot of it, but we're starting to get more information because a lot more players have entered the ring in recent years. Due to the naked mole rats' relative lack of aging and low occurrence of age-associated disease, they've become a hot subject of study for cancer researchers and anyone interested in anti-aging. And could some detail of the naked mole rat's genome hold the key to slowing down human aging? Quoting Wired, As the damage from aging accumulates, it also accelerates. Your body observes something called the Gompertz Mortality Law, a mathematical model that quantifies how the intrinsic risk of death increases exponentially as an animal gets older. Although lifespans vary for different species, the shape of the Gompertz curve is canon. A lab mouse's risk of dying doubles every three months or so. For a dog, it's about every three years. Once a human turns 25, their risk of dying doubles every eight years. Naked mole rats don't play by these rules. End quote. Sure, they technically age, and of course they die, especially from killing each other when they threaten another community's territory, but their risk of dying pretty much stays flat throughout their lives. Quoting further, it's not that naked mole rats never age or get sick, they do, but their bodies somehow slow those processes down. While typical mammals' bones get more brittle and thin over the years, mole rat bones keep the same mineral content and remain just as solid. People tend to tack on more fat with age. Naked mole rats? Nope. But the most striking system, says Buffenstein, is cardiovascular. Human veins and arteries normally stiffen with time. The more rigid those walls get, the harder the heart has to pump. Blood pressure goes up, risk of death goes up. Naked mole rat blood vessels stay springy throughout life. Every measure that we've looked at in heart function is unchanged from 6 months to 24 years, she says, end quote. They also very, very rarely get cancer. In a study of over 3,000 mole rat autopsies, Buffenstein has only identified five instances of cancer. There are a lot of possible reasons being explored, but a leading theory has to do with a protein called P53, a protein known to suppress tumors. This is a protein that we humans have as well, but naked mole rats have 10 times more of it. And there's another protein that could be at play in slowing down their cellular aging, NRF2, another one that we and all mammals have, but in naked mole rats, it's more active. Quote, NRF2 works as a sort of crossing guard for antioxidants, detoxicants, and proteins that keep other proteins from misfolding. Every time I look, it seems to be regulating something else that's equally important for aging and longevity, says Buffenstein. Heart disease, diabetes, depression, she continues, just about every disease that you can think of seems to have an accompanying low level of NRF2. End quote. NRF2 is activated by certain drugs like metformin for diabetes and rapamycin, an immunosuppressant, the latter of which has been proven to extend lifespans by 25% in mice. But trying to reapply NRF2 or P53 for different uses is dangerous. Buffenstein points out that having too much of it or too little could both be a bad thing. And while the exact right amount of one of those proteins could make some difference, the more likely scenario is that naked mole rats are just straight up weirdos with dozens of unique factors working in concert together, a concert that could never fully be performed by humans. For example, their muted pain receptors and ability to survive long periods of time without oxygen are probably not a result of some enzyme that we could hack for humans, but rather, at least in part, traits adapted over many generations of them living in densely populated burrows. Regardless, the study of naked mole rats as well as other long-living mammals will only continue to ramp up as advances in biotech like genome analysis enable more sophisticated research. And even as mysteries remain, Buffenstein says, quote, I sort of like the fact that the animals are winning, and we haven't quite got there yet. End quote. So Los Angeles is moving the date of its county fair, but it's not delaying it because of the pandemic. The 2021 fair is already canceled. No, for 2022, the county fair is actually being moved up. Instead of its usual September time frame that it's kept for almost 100 years, the three-week fair will now take place in May. The reason? 
Los Angeles is so hot in September that people had stopped going to the fair. The LA Times notes that in 2019, the last time the fair happened, they saw a sharp decrease in visitors, and temperatures were above 90 degrees for 14 out of the 19 days that it ran for. The county fair has invested thousands over the years on umbrellas, misters, and other shade areas, but it hasn't been enough. Many have advocated for a shift to May for years, but the two-year break caused by the pandemic has finally given vendors and operators enough time to make preparations for the shift. Journalist Alyssa Walker pointed out just how ominous a harbinger of our climate crisis-tinged future this move really is by saying, quote, Rescheduling a century-old event to a cooler month is only the beginning, and I don't think anyone is fully prepared for how quickly our definition of summer will change, end quote. Which, like, yikes. So to end on a slightly more upbeat note here, the Paramount Plus reboot of Nickelodeon cartoon Rugrats debuted today, and it turns out that longtime queer icon Phil and Lil's mom, Betty, is openly and canonically gay in the reboot. In the original series, Betty had a husband named Howard, a minor detail. Now, she is a single mom and cafe owner who apparently references her ex-girlfriend on the reg. Natalie Morales, who voices Betty, said, quote, Yeah, Betty is a fictional cartoon, but even cartoons were hugely influential for me as a kid, and if I'd been watching Rugrats and seeing Betty casually talking about her ex-girlfriend, I think at least a part of me would have felt like things might be okay in the future. End quote. Go Betty! But that's it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.